My name is Vera Lester, and uh, Tiffany and I have known each other. She reminded me a minute ago since junior high, um, and it is really my um, my honor and my privilege to be here today. Um, I want to welcome all of you to this remembrance and memorial for Otis Harvey Fennell Jr. And while it's tempting for us to come together with heavy hearts, please let us remember that those hearts are laid heavy with stories of love. And as we begin, we start with a prayer. Heavenly Father, please see both the suffering and the joy of the people who are gathered here today to remember Otis Fennell. When their hearts grow heavy with sorrow, please bring back memories of the connections that each of them shared with him and the connection he allowed each of us to have with each other. When our hearts feel heavy with grief, Help us to remember that that heaviness is the density of love that we felt for him and the love that he awakened in each other. We humbly ask you to welcome Otis, his spirit and his memory into your kingdom forever so that he can join with all of his family who are there already and so that all of them may watch over us and offer us protection and guidance in every moment of our lives to come. Help us to always remember the celebration of today and the stories that we will share. And most importantly, the profound love that we had for Otis and that he had for all of us. Amen. Otis was a celebrator. He was a rememberer and a connector. He was larger than life. Right? And because of that, I think he's larger than death. It might have been impossible for any of us to know him completely because he lived so many different lives. And so sharing our stories with each other about him is really that much more important. Today we remember him as a loving and dedicated father to Tiffany and Britt, a loving and dedicated grandfather to Riley, Luke, Mark, and Johnny. He was a thoughtful husband and a respectful friend, and he was also a proud gay man. To be born in Natchez, Mississippi in 1947, and to grow up in the Deep South in a Catholic family, and to go to LSU to become a pike, it probably would have been easy for him to feel ashamed or to hide who he really was. But that was not Otis. Instead, he moved to New Orleans where he would become the youngest director of economic development for the New Orleans Chamber, and eventually become the owner and the steward of Frenchman Art and Books, which was so much more than a bookstore. It was really a center of community for thousands of us, a place to connect and to share stories and to remember. Otis could not hide, and he showed us that being who, we, who he was and who we are is not just okay, but that it was something to be celebrated because that's who Otis was. He was like an embodiment of celebration and joy. And even after he sold the bookstore, he continued to hold court on the, on the corner of Frenchman and St. Charles. And so we called him the mayor of Frenchman Street. And that's what he was. 
Because if there's anything that Otis taught us, it's that we really only have three things in life. We have our stories, and we have our celebrations, and we have each other. It seems to me that everything that Otis did was about those three things. It was about remembrance and celebration and each other. When he co-founded the Legacy Project with Stuart Butler, whose incredible home we are now in, he proved that, that those stories were not only worth telling, but that they needed to be remembered. That this history was worth recording and sharing with all of the generations to come. He helped to create the No AIDS Task Force at the height of the AIDS epidemic, demonstrating how important each of us really are. No AIDS affirmed the well-being and the dignity of so many people who suffered with HIV and AIDS. And if you didn't know him, you might hear stories like the Legacy Project and the New Orleans AIDS Task Force and think that this was a very serious man. <laughs> but that doesn't touch the heart of Otis. He was celebratory and he was loving and he was radically joyful. My prayer today is that each of us, as we share our stories of Otis and the celebration that he really taught each of us, that we remember that sparkle and his humor and playfulness. Because I believe that only people who have really suffered and struggled understand that this life is too precious to not be celebrated. It's too important to be bogged down with a heavy heart. So it is our celebration and our stories that will connect us with each other today and they make every moment worth it. And the legacy that Otis leaves is deeper and wider than the bookstore or No Aids or the Legacy Project. Because as each one of us leaves here today, going back to our own families and our own communities, we'll be a little bit more connected to our own stories and to each other and to that spirit of celebration. And that's how we will live his legacy for all of the generations to come. I wanna invite Tiffany and Britt to return Otis's ashes to the earth. And if you all will indulge me, um, I want to invite all of us to sing um, I'll Fly Away. And if you don't know the lyrics, there are, there are lyrics here. <coughs> Just hold that right here, but most of us know it pretty well. It starts, Some Glad Morning. Some glad morning, when this life is over, ah. Just a few more weary days. Just a few more weary days and then I'll away to a land where joy will never end.
Thank you. Well, hell. <laughs> Perfect time. Uh, yes, he's calling. He's like, y'all, y'all are off key. <laughs> so does Colin to say thank you. As we close tonight, this afternoon, we pray that the great sustaining Mother Earth receives Otis's body back into her soil so that he may mingle with all those who have gone before and to prepare each of us for the new life that is to come. We send gratitude to our Heavenly Father for welcoming Otis and his spirit and his memory into his kingdom so that Otis may be free from any pain or restriction or suffering that came from being inside a human body. Most of all, we pray that the love and the joy and the celebration that Otis taught us lives eternally in each of our hearts and minds. Amen. Hi. I'm Patricia Unig. Patty. Patty to everybody that knows Otis and me. Um, I knew Otis since college. He was my uh, grad student assistant teacher at LSU before he ever met Betty. Betty was my best friend, his wife, from kindergarten. And born and raised in New Orleans, live in California. This is the area now. Um, Otis, as you know, was Otis. The last time I saw him, I was in town during Mardi Gras time. I saw him in Toro the 27th of March. He was out of ICU and in his tights, shamrock tights that he had bought at uh, um, that was the gift bad. store because he thought he was in heaven where he could get fed, his medications, he wasn't attached to anything, you know, he had all this stuff on his arm, but he was free and he just wanted to go for a walk or a smoke and oh hello um, and he uh, you know we had to go they already knew him at the front desk because he had been there so many times in the first day and they knew his name and his shopping habits etc but the other famous story I love to tell about Otis is in when he was working for economic development in the 70s um, we went to Europe with uh, Daddy Moriel and uh, a chamber city event. And we stayed a couple of extra days and I was staying in the same rooms with them. And when we got ready to leave, Otis didn't want to leave. <laughs> and I have pictures and vivid memories of him hanging on to this gorgeous 1700 iron balcony and Betty and I prying him away <laughs> so we could make the plane Aww. and that's the kind of life he lived entirely and loved knowing him loved being at his apartment loved doing everything and of course loved his daughters thank you, thank you. My name's Ron Julian, and I'm a secular steward of his estate, trustee of the Stuart Butler and Alfred D. Little Memorial Trust. Speak in the mic, Ron. Can't hear you. The, 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 uh, it's the Stuart Butler and Albert Al, Alfred Doolittle Memorial Trust that keeps this place from where we are right now. Bill Hagler, some of you met Bill, I'm sure he's... Uh, Bill, Bill. raise your hand. Knowledge, Bill Hagler. Bill Hagler took care of Stuart, was his caregiver for 10 years. Those were 10 wonderful years that we had Stuart. It enhanced his life, our life, and Bill right now is taking care of the Ferry Playhouse. 
I want to say that um, it's quite an honor to have Otis here with 20-something other folks that are placed here. Their remains, partial remains, cremains. We have a little name plaque for each of those. We have it inside. There is a plaque also recognizing those folks. And the, there's the plan with the Ferry Playhouse Center. We have incorporated and we, our plans are to purchase this place and keep it as a memorial, not just to Stuart and Alfred, but uh, to all the people that came through these doors. By the way, uh, April 20th, 1979, this very day, Stuart purchased the playhouse. I don't know who planned this, maybe it was Divine Providence, whatever, that we met here today uh, on the occasion in which he purchased this place. 1979, and Frank, probably what, 1980 is when he really started his activism. And the playhouse continues to this day. I have here now Dr. Catherine Cooper back that way. For let's acknowledge Dr. Catherine Cooper with the National Park Service. Today we have the National Park Service did a virtual tour of this place. For the others of you uh, who would like one of these, one of the QR codes, we have a card here with our uh, FerryPlayhouse.org. You can go and see what we're what we're about, but. Again, this will give you a virtual tour. Before Stuart died, he, uh, I said, Stuart, we've got to figure out how many folks came through here. And I've seen many of the faces who are still alive who came through this place. We looked at his uh, guest log, his uh, visitors list, mailing list, everyone. At first, he wasn't interested in. We got up to about 200 before uh, he was unable to finish the project. We have the Ferry Playhouse collection. I'm, I work at the UNO archives here at the University of New Orleans. When Stewart died, uh, his papers, before he died, his papers went to Tulane. Well, I'm going through these cabinets over here, and I find over 126 different files for individuals, organizations, every sort of thing. And uh, as I'm thinking, I said, this is not just Stuart and Alfred. This is about those 200 and put up to like 600 people I have on a roster or listing who've come through this door since 1979, particularly 80 onward, and still coming through. This is going to be a memorial to them, just as it is to Otis, the inspiration of all these other great activists who's honored us with portions of all of the remains here. Uh, I will leave these uh, QR codes in our website over here on the table if you'd like to pick up on them. We thank you for coming and it's quite an honor and tribute to have Otis here with us. for coming. Can you hear me? Yes. Um, I'm Britt Schneeman. I'm Otis's firstborn daughter. Um, actually, to be clear, dad is, adopted me when I was in womb. He, uh, he was a tenant of my mom's and she was divorced and pregnant. And, you know, they loved each other. They always loved each other. And, um, you know, even now I think to myself, if my son, Luke, brought home a three-month pregnant girlfriend <laughs> that was recently <laughs> divorced, I might not like it so much. Um, and so I think that was a struggle for his family. And, um, but, you know, lucky me. Lucky me. Yeah. Lucky me. So he adopted me, and I've always been Britt Finnell until I got married. And he um, he gave me so much of his courage. You know, he he was quiet sometimes, and he was not always pushing his own will. But then at other times, he could be quite willful. And I wanted to study acting and you know one of dad's dreams was to study acting and to be an actor he even performed at the museum of art 
one time in a play, which Richard could probably remember. And I, I remember seeing him on stage and thinking, oh my God, now he's acting. Like, really? Um, because he was, he was a jack of all trades, right? He did it all. And he could be a businessman one minute, and then he could be an actor the next minute, and then he could be a bookkeeper and super serious, and then he could be dressed in pink head to toe with feathers <laughs> all over and not dressed at all. So he was, uh, he was fun to have as a dad. And um, I'd like to share just one last fun story at the end about a few weeks before he died, he, he called us and he said, you know, he never wanted to talk about death, by the way. And let me tell you, that man could have died many, many times, you know, in the, he was told as a child he wouldn't live past 30 because of his juvenile diabetes. And then when he had HIV in the 90s when I was in college, we all thought, well, we don't have much time. And he beat it. He did. He, he found a trial. He got those ACTs. Nobody knew it was going to work. And it worked. He's that smart and that progressive and that ahead of his time and that determined to survive. And this time, he called me and he said he was in the hospital and we couldn't find a home for him. And we didn't know what to do. And I, I knew he needed nursing care because he was starting to have some memory loss and he couldn't maintain his insulin levels three times a day. Anyway, so I said, you know, Dad, this is very bad. This is very bad. You're going to be homeless and you can't keep track of your insulin. And I was, I was so upset and I was calling his sister and I was calling my sister. David was helping quite a bit and we all were trying to figure out what the next steps would be. And we would say, Otis, what do you think? And he would say, oh, so much negativity. <laughs> Such bad vibes. I just, I just need to come to California and be with you in LA and let all this blow over. <laughs> and I, oh God, he can barely go downstairs and he wants to come to LA with me and let things blow over. And we laughed because that was his reality. So we always called him our little Peter Pan. And um, he was. He was he was Peter Pan. With all the joy and all the fun and the twinkle. And um, when he passed, I was very, very sad because I wasn't expecting it to happen so quickly. But I'm glad for him to be out of the situation that was beginning to really erode. So it is for joy that we all come together now, even though we will miss him very, very much. He lived a good and full life, and this is a celebration of his life. And all of you, his friends and his supporters, and all the lives and people he touched, and the bravery that he showed me every day by being himself by not ever hiding from who he was. So that is his legacy. Thank you. Hello. I'm David Zolkind. I, uh, uh, the legacy that Otis, uh, brought to Frenchman Street. Uh, he handed a torch uh, to me in 2018 uh, and uh, said, hey, run this bookstore. Uh, and actually, he wasn't really ready to retire. Um, his daughters called me up and said, David, you've known Otis for a long time, and I have since 1985. And, uh, we were in business together at the time, and uh, as strange uh, as it was, uh, we got along. And, uh, uh, and over the years, uh, the daughters grew up. I saw them, saw you in LA. Helped you get going, <laughs> quick, crazy place. And uh, Otis made that call. So when I moved back to New Orleans. Um, 
I would visit Otis and uh, I just couldn't believe how much fun he was having in a place where he stayed open for 12 hours a day. I, I, he never, I, I, I don't know how he slept. Uh, and uh, uh, I, uh, I understand that he was thrust upon by uh, the landlord who lives above the bookstore. Uh, and said, I don't know anyone who can operate, operate the bookstore. They had two, two people before that. And she said, why don't you open? And Otis had never operated a bookstore at all. <laughs> um, but he earned quite a reputation of having the most eclectic items from all over. It was just an amazing experience. I think all of you have been there. And uh, it was like, it was like uh, an attic. Everybody's attic. Uh, and uh, so, uh, when uh, his health went south a little bit, uh, that's when Tiffany and Britt called me up and said, we got to get him to retire. And uh, I asked my wife, Gretchen, do you want to do this? Because uh, we've never operated a bookstore before. So uh, Otis, uh, at the end, he had five years of retirement. He really enjoyed himself. He got to really just, I don't think he's ever, as far as I've known, he's, he's always working. He's always doing something. And so, uh, lucky if, if, if all of us could have it, you know, that many years of pure retirement of just, he would come by the bookstore, he would sit uh, in a chair in front and uh, say hello to everybody. He was, he was, and, and he, was the, he was the mayor of Frenchman Street. And uh, quick short story. The way I met him, I was working on a project, a real estate project, and I need to find out the demographics of the warehouse district in the 80s at that time. It was absolutely devastated. Nothing was happening. And uh, I uh, was told to go to the Chamber of Commerce. So I go to the corner office, they direct me there, and there's Otis Spinell. Can you imagine him in the chamber? <laughs> chamber. Uh, Very yeah. Totally, and unlike what we all see, have seen him as of late. And uh, he was so cooperative, he was so excited about the warehouse district, and uh, uh, and gave me all kinds of information. He wanted to know more about it, he wanted to visit, and actually I think Press Kabakov is here. There he is. Uh, he's the man who helped make the warehouse district, you know, he believed in it, and today I don't even know if you can possibly believe that it is what it is today. It's amazing. At that time, it was just, you know, one beautiful building that came off of the where, the uh, the World's Fair, and uh, Otis was so excited about it, and uh, wanted to be a part of it. And uh, eventually, the uh, Chamber of Commerce, uh, his tenure was up, and uh, he came and helped me uh, market the building. And that's how Press and I got to, to know each other as well. And uh, so he was there at the beginning um, of this development. And uh, so that's how I got to know him, and that's how I got to be up here <laughs> eventually. And, uh, you know, so from there, you know, the, every day he came, and uh, he wouldn't take any help from anybody. It was impossible. I know you tried, you know, he just said, I can do it, I can do it. All of you all saved him. I'm sure every one of you has a story about how you found him at the bookstore and he was on the, lying down because he hadn't taken his insulin. And he must have, he must have had, a, you know, dozens and dozens of angels with him uh, that kept him going. So he, he, uh, uh, he lived a, a good life and um, uh, I'm going to try to uh, keep his legacy going. So thank you. I'm Tiffany. I'm uh, Otis's daughter. I did not prepare anything, so I'm just going to wing it and tell you a story that I shared with my sister the other night. Um, I remember when I was about 12 years old, I went to my dad and I said, these girls are making me feel so sad and so upset because they were being mean. And he said, darling, which is how, you know, if you feel, I can hear it in my head, darling, no one can make you feel anything that you don't decide to feel. And no one can make you be anyone that you don't decide to be. You control how you feel and you control how you show up in the world and who you are. 
Um, and I said, whatever, you don't know 12-year-old girls. Um, <laughs> then, you know, when my therapist told me a couple of years ago, I was like, that's so smart. Uh, <laughs> that is truly what dad realized, you know, that nobody told him who he could be or who he shouldn't be, who he should love, who he should where he should work, what, you know, he was his own unique individual person. Um, and he supported that in so many other people. He supported that in me. He supported my sister moving to California at 17 to pursue a career in acting. Um, he showed me sides of myself and taught me sides of myself that made me a truly unique, wonderful human um, because of him. And I see faces. Um, I met a gentleman, Chris over there. Um, I remember he's like, I don't know if you remember me, but like 15 years ago, I was like, I do remember you because dad saw something in this guy um, that was so beautiful. And, um, you know, I think you were 18. I'm like, what is my dad doing with this 18 year old boy? Jeez, please, dad. Um, but he saw the beauty and uniqueness and wonderfulness in people and he brought it out. Um, and I am so grateful for that. So grateful for him, it's my dad, um, and that's all. And I, I appreciate what he saw in everyone here, and I love all the stories that you're sharing about how he brought that out in you and encouraged you and advocated for you and saw you. Thank you all for being here. Hi, good afternoon. Um, I wasn't going to speak, but after hearing you speak, I had to come up and say something. <laughs> My name is Noel Twolbeck, and I served as the uh, Executive Director and CEO of Crescent Care uh, and No AIDS Task Force. Uh, so I've known Otis for quite some time. Um, and I can remember in the earlier years when I met Otis, Otis was involved in the clinical trials here in New Orleans and uh, would come to me and say, Noel, you need to, you need to get off your ass. You need to, we need to support the clinical trials. We can't lose them in New Orleans. We eventually did, but Otis still was a warrior. Uh, through the years, uh, as Otis served on the Board of Trustees, we were developing programs at uh, No AIDS and Crescent Care, and Otis periodically would call me or come and see me and say, Noel, we need to do more. It's like, Otis, we're getting a primary care clinic gone. We've got prevention gone. We're working on housing. I don't have any more money. He said, you need to do more. And uh, I said, well, you know, tell me, tell me what are you talking about? People still have needs. We don't have enough resources in our community. People need a place to go. People need a place to meet other people. People need support. We need peer support. Um, we need education. And um, Otis's voice was always in my head about, we need to do more. We need to do more. And uh, I guess the legacy that Otis has left with me was, we still need to do more. I'm not with No AIDS and Crescent Care any longer, but for our community, we still need to do more. Thank you, Otis. I wasn't going to speak either, but since my name was brought up, <laughs> I felt there needs to be a little bit of an explanation. So anyway, yeah, it was, uh, I don't remember meeting Otis, so uh, because it was in the middle of Mardi Gras, and it was really late, and I was really dark, and it was really drunk, and um, <laughs> so anyway, uh, I do remember um, coming out of the fog and the haze and looking up from the courtyard pool and seeing Otis up on the balcony going... Are you okay down there? And I'm like, yeah, I think I'm okay. I mean, where am I? What's going on? So, but anyway, that's just the way Otis was. He rescued me from the dark craziness of Mardi Gras, and um, we became friends after that. And I think I'm one of the many people that he probably rescued out there, uh, many of you probably, in some way or another. And I want all of us to remember that he's probably up there looking down on us right now. My name is Katie Nashad, and I first knew Otis as just that cool, good-looking guy at Fab Books, and um, or I guess that's what Doug did at Fab. And um, then, when through synchronicity and serendipity, I was put in George DeRoe's path near the end of his life when he needed help, and I discovered that. Every day, George took a very long bike ride, and I didn't know at first where he went, and I was always worried about if he would come home safely. 
and through various people in the neighborhood, I found out that he rode his bike every day down Royal Street the wrong way, <laughs> sometimes getting a ticket, and he ended up at Otis's bookstore to visit with him and hold court and go on to Bicycle Michael's where they took care of his, he was on his bicycle and he always needed something. And then he went all the way back up to the warehouse district to visit, bug and harass Arthur Roger and his staff at the gallery who represented him. And so I got to know Otis more personally because of George and uh, we started the Friends of George to help take care of George when he was in his hour, his years of need actually. And I just, I was so impressed with Otis's gentle strength and kindness. And I still have an image that he came to help me muck out George's three-story gallery and home when George was in a nursing home. And he went through all the books and he said, if you want, and I didn't ask him to do anything, but he said, if you want, I will take these books and I will sell them in my bookstore and I will give you all the money to help pay for George's medical care. <laughs> I thought, thank you. And I still have an image of him. I, he had a little sports car, a convertible. I think it was a Triumph. And he piled the books in this little car, and right in front, he got a parking place right in front, you know, God's grace, and he piled, I mean, the books were as high as his head, which was pretty high, and he had to fold his long body. I still can see him getting in that triumph and roaring <laughs> off on Bienville to turn and go down Charters, and I just, I have that image in my head, and I didn't ask him to do that, but he did it out of the kindness of his heart, and I will never forget him. And I thought I had received all the gifts from Otis that I was going to get. But in his obituary, I found out that he grew up in, in Brookhaven, Mississippi, at least went to high school there. And I have met six or seven people who I think I'm related to. <laughs> so Otis, I wish I had known that he had lived in Brookhaven because we could have talked about that. And I think I might be related to him. And I have no idea. And now I want to know more. And I've made contact with wonderful cousins and sister and brother and sister-in-law and brother. And, and I just i am so excited. So he's the gift that keeps on giving. <laughs> Hey Otis, what the hell are you doing? <laughs> I'd say pretty good. I met Otis on the front porch of my parents' house when it was tented for one of my sister's weddings. As Otis, Otis's wife Betty taught school with my sister Jamie. So that's back in the, I want to say 1920s, but no, it's not true. <laughs> I wasn't born until 45 and he was like two years later. But uh, at least it was like the 1970s. So he was this quiet little married man on my parents' front porch swing. He was very vivacious. Your, your mother was gorgeous. Daddy was just the most beautiful, most fun person. I still hear him laughter. You know, uh, Otis loved Betty. He really did. I said, well, "Did you always have girlfriends and boyfriends too?" He said, uh, "Yeah." Got a unique father for sure. Anyway, he was a good friend. Uh, what to say about Otis. Uh, I used to bring some paintings to Otis for his bookshop and he'd sell them for me. You know, the crazier paintings I had, the better he sold them. So that was good. And uh, in the later years, I was his private chauffeur. Aww. So last May, my car died for the second time, couldn't revive it. So it really hurt our coffee club. So I would go pick him up like once every week or two. We'd go have coffee. Coffee and donuts, he'd say, if we got it without the powdered sugar, he'd eat a donut once in a while. But not Cafe Du Monde. It was much better at morning coffee. He approved, he approved it. Right? So the last few years, he got quieter and quieter. Yeah. And literally, this place we had a winter dead. At the Trinity House kept him alive because they gave him breakfast, lunch, and dinner for the last five years or so. And I think they, they guided his insulin as well. So that was a, a necessary thing. So he would not he would not have been here because really he was passed out on the floor of his apartment on Westway Avenue. And I had to 
force his, his, his roommate to go back there and get the door open. Hey, prayer number two. Uh, anyway, so oh, Britomir found Otis that place to live. You know, thank you, Britomir. So of all these different miracles, Otis stayed alive for five or six more years, you know, and uh, we, we go to, uh, we start taking cabs now, since we didn't have the car anymore. That would be like, that, that, that. every three weeks, we go to Canal Place and see a movie. So we just saw Oppenheimer together. And so he was putting paper towels in his ears because the, the volume was so loud in the movie theater. I said, well, let me, let me go talk to the manager about this. And I did, I said, uh, excuse me, sir, but you know, we can't, the movie is so loud, we, we, we can't, we're holding our ears to listen to the movie. It was like this. The screen was practically rumbling, you know? And he's looking at me like, mm. <laughs> So we just put more Kleenex in our ears and watched it. And afterwards went down and discovered a new restaurant in front of Canal Place, but it had, what was it, uh, O.J. Burgers or something like that? Anyway. He was ready to always go somewhere. If he felt the least bit good, yes, come pick me up, let's go. And I'm even waiting on the front steps for forever. I'm like, I'm to get dressed. And cigarettes. So the last time, I, the last two times I saw Otis was in the University Hospital in February, the day of the Endymion Parade. <clears throat> when I got there, I just come back from Lafayette because my sister was dying there, and he said, "Go get me some cigarettes." <laughs> and, and I said, "Well, what else? You want? Coffee. I want a good cup of coffee." So I said, okay. First I said, "No, I'm not getting you the cigarettes." He said, <laughs> yeah. No, just Richard. I said, I, I, that's what you really want. That's what I'll do. I'll go get you some cigarettes. So he gave me twenty dollars, and the cigarettes cost nineteen ninety-two for two packs, and some of the place across the street. <laughs> and guy went ca decaf cafe. Well, they had a PJs on the first floor of University Hospital. So well, you know, something he wanted that they didn't have. There was there was, there was a Walgreens in that hospital, but it was only open for prescriptions, and it wasn't open on a Saturday. So. <clears throat> I spent the day with him that day, and it was like, you'd think how, you know, it was an angel from heaven, because he was like, yeah, so thrilled to see somebody. Apparently nobody had visited him except Patty and me, thank goodness. And then, yeah, there were more people, God bless those people, I don't know. Um, and then I had a, a skin cancer appointment next door, when he was at Turo. Uh, in March, back in March, in March, in March, in March, in March, heavy rainstorm. So, I got to go visit Otis at the skin doctor. Brought my lunch with me. Said, you know, what do you, what do you want me to get for you? He said, no, nothing, just, just be here. So we spent the afternoon there, me eating lunch and him watching TV. I said, well, what's going on? What do you, what do you want me to do? And the said, Brittany Mir is taking care of everything. I don't have to do anything. He said, I'm just, he's just lounging in the, in the, in the room with his uh, pink, pink pillow and, uh, and watching drop, you know, soap operas, right? Anyway, it poured down rain that day, and uh, <clears throat> I remember calling up uh, Lyft for uh, see how much it would cost to go back to Belgium. And they said forty-two dollars. I just said, oh. <laughs> My sister had given me the phone number of somebody named Mr. Jimmy, and she got this phone number at the Bible class that she was teaching, and uh, I gave it to everybody there. And this guy was like a retired religion teacher at Saint Brother Martin, Saint Martin, Brother Martin. So I got his phone number. I called him. He said, I'll, I'll get you home for $20. So he says, I brought you that good luck. Yeah. <laughs> so that was my last visit with Otis. He brought me the good luck of getting half, half fair care ride across town in a flood. Anyway, so we spoke on the phone since then, but it was not, that wasn't the, the best month of his life. So 10 days later, he passed away. And I was in Lafayette. So he was a, a very stable friend. We had many. Uh, Christmas Eve lunches together, and uh, oh yeah, yeah. But anyway, y'all want to go get coffee? Okay. I love them. I love this family. Thank you, Otis. Otis, repeat the name Jesus, Otis. It'll gonna get you somewhere good. <laughs>
I knew I was called to get some you know, you do last call, and everybody runs for the bar, and so nobody did that. But I was sitting over there thinking of all the things that. My name is Glade Bilby. I have lived across from Otis for years on Esplanade, uh, and so I knew a lot of stories. And I've lived in the quarter since 1978, so I even know more stories. I knew these two when they were like that big, maybe. Um, one of the interesting things I heard David say was about angels. I think that can go both ways. I think Otis was an angel to a lot of us. He inspired us. He gave us hope. He gave us the inspiration to say what you wanted to say, be who you wanted to be. And I think that was most interesting. I was an angel to Otis a number of times when I would look outside and I'd say, Otis, on the sidewalk? You know, where he needed candy, yeah. orange juice, yeah. something to get him up into his house. Um, Noel, Noel said something about New Age Task Force and I was fortunate enough to be able to do some posters for the task force. Um, and it was a uh, use a condom campaign. And it was great. It was in all the bars. You might remember that. And it was fantastic. Otis kept asking me, who are those guys? Who, who are those guys? And I said, I don't know them. I don't, I don't really know them. I don't really know them. But the interesting thing is, I knew him when he first started the bookstore. And you'd go over there and there's nobody on French Street. Not like today. I mean, it's not like Bourbon Street it's today. So you'd sit over there and you could talk to Otis about all the stories. And I used to hang out with Becky Allen and Kenny Wesson and Freddie Palmazano and Louis Barroso and Ricky Graham, Dangerous. Klein Stewart. You remember these names? Some of you remember these names. Yeah. And my good friend Stuart Baker Bergen was the first person I ever knew uh, got AIDS in 1986, and that's when he died. And this guy used to travel around the world with everybody. Uh, he, he performed on Broadway with Meryl Streep. He performed with the Mama Experimental Theater and Baalbek and, 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 and Beirut and, and, and he kept incredible journals of everything that happened to him. The most mundane things he made interesting to the most spectacular things he made interesting. But when he, when he was in the hospital with AIDS, he wrote these incredible journals and he said, all right, I want you to tell. And he called me Little Bucky. I'm going to share that with you. Okay, Little Bucky. Little Bucky, I want you to tell everybody. And he listed all these names. Uh, his dad's name was Red Hot because he played trumpet. And he listed all these names. I want you to tell everybody what's happening to me and uh, not to feel sad. And part of it was, well, how would it be? Uh, somebody's got to die first. Should we all go together? That wouldn't be too pretty. But what I want to leave with you is kind of the very end of his journals. It said, I want you to know, and I think Otis would say this as well, heaven was being on earth with all of you all. Aww. I can't imagine a better note to end on. <laughs> um, heaven is being on earth with all of y'all. Um, just want to say thank you to Tiffany and Britt and to the family and to Otis for bringing us together for one last time. And please help yourself. There are um, beverages and snacks inside. And um, thanks for sharing your memories with us.